Hi, welcome to another episode of Swarajya Conversations. Today we have with us Dr. Sarjit Bhalla. Thank you so much for taking out the yeah. time, sir. Thank you. He was a chairman of the High Level Advisory Group, and most recently he authored a book, Citizen Raj, which documents the Indian elections from 1952 to 2019. Today he will be discussing with us the implications of the recent economic reforms, what the Indian economy needs, and are we ready for that five trillion mark the PM is so ambitious about? Hi, sir. So let's start with the first question, which is mm. something that's been going on for a while now: the current slowdown. Mm -hmm. So, what do you attribute the slowdown to? What are the factors that are contributing this to the slowdown? Because the slowdown is imminent in a lot of areas. It's in the auto industry. It's in the FMCG industry. So, where do we attribute the slowdown? Well, <clears throat> as you say, I mean it is a controversial and debatable uh, topic. Um, let me just mention that I've just finished. Uh, the analysis of the recent 2017-18 annual survey of industries data, um, and which is only on industries, and this slowdown is dominantly in the industrial sector, not in the service sector. Though I'll come to that in a minute. And what it appears is that 2017-18 um, was a good year for the economy across all sectors, whether you're looking at employment. And remember, this is the year right after demonetization, which was 2016-17. So what, and 2016-17, 2014-15 and 15-16, those previous two years were drought years. This was the year of 2016-17 uh, demonetization and 17-18, despite the uncertainties caused by the introduction of GST, um, the economy did rather well. <coughs> now, what happened? So first explanation for the economy doing rather well was that the previous three years were problematic years. Droughts and the GST. So it's a bounce back from those years. But there has been a pervasive force underlying the Indian economy. And I've only been able to identify one source for the mishap. It's not the fiscal side because the fiscal side has been expansionary. It's the monetary side. And in the monetary side, this is prior to the slowdown that you're referring to, in the monetary side, we move from a regime of very, very low real interest rates, mm -hmm. um, somewhere in the region of minus, average of minus three, minus four for the previous five years, to plus three and plus four. This was happening already, as I said, but the bounce back from the previous episodes prevented from us observing. The RBI merrily went along and raised rates because they thought we had bounced back to whatever levels. So if you want to put to the timing, the timing of it is really coincident with about June to September of last year when the slowdown started. That is the NBFC crisis, that well-known NBF. Yes. So credit dried up. People are not, if, if I am not able to borrow to lend, if I am losing that side, everything dries up. And I think the RBI thought that the economy was doing so well that they even hiked twice, remember, in 2018. And I think that led to and precipitated this crisis that we observed in 2019, the first two quarters, right. calendar 2019. So now there have been a set of economic reforms uh, quite mm. recently by the finance ministry. So how do you see these reforms? Are they enough to tackle the NBFC, the way they have dried up, mm -hmm. the merger of the banks? So how do we look at these reforms? Are they good enough or are they too little too late? No, I don't think they're too little too late. I, again, I want to separate out fiscal and monetary. So let's just look at the fiscal side. And the fiscal side, the finance minister has announced that the expenditures will stay the same and has announced a big corporate tax cut. That I think, you know, one cannot possibly ask for much more from the fiscal side, from the finance minister's side, from the economy as seen from Delhi. So I think that is definitely enough. However, 
there are two sides to an economy or two determinants of an economy, fiscal policy and uh, monetary policy. For monetary policy, we've got to wait and see. On that, let me just point out that the April to August of last year, inflation rates, the average inflation rate was something like 4.8% or 4.7%. April to August this year, when Shakti Khan Das, the RBI governor, reduced rates by 110 basis points, a really welcome uh, trend or welcome gesture from the MPC and from the governor. At that time, the inflation rate was 140 basis points less than last year. So what has happened? 2019, this is now we are talking about the big crisis that occurred. Remember, April to June is when you had 5.5%. And uh, January to March, you had 5.8%. So this is all going on. And as we are trying to rectify, we find that we are actually making the situation worse. Did make, in my view, the situation worse. Because I, perhaps one of the few economists in India who looks at the real rate rather than nominal rate. Let me point out, nowhere else in the world is the discussion on nominal rates. It is true that when we talk about the Fed, etc., that we talk about in nominal terms. It's 1.25, 1.5, 1.75, the Fed uh, funds rate. The reason is because inflation there has been constant between 1.5 and 2% for last 25 years. So that is why they move. When you have this radical move from double-digit inflation, to something like three and three and a half percent, I think it's imperative for you journalists, for economists, and especially for the policymaker to think real. Unfortunately, the, the three groups that I've described do not think in real terms. And I think that's, if you want to look at a philosophical flaw in policymaking in India, especially monetary policymaking, it is that it is working on a, um, uh, on a nominal model rather than a real model. Put it very simply, cost of credit is too high. The cost of credit in India is indeed the highest that we have ever observed and around 3.5% when it should be close to zero, the real cost of credit of the real repo rate and the highest in the world. So here is, so let me just summarize. Here we have, you're justifiably saying that we've had a remarkable slowdown, independent of what reasons you go into it, remarkable slowdown. And that slowdown has been accompanied by and persisted with the highest real rates in the world. Yes. If you can explain or give me any other explanation for the slowdown, I'll be happy to hear. So last weekend, one of the biggest uh, corporate tax cuts that you just mentioned, it had the market soaring. Uh -huh. The market responded rather positive, uh, positively to the uh -huh. deduction. So uh, walk us through the current corporate tax cuts. How do you think on a national level first, they can enable better uh, investor sentiment, better atmosphere for business groups, and how it can help us tackle the slowdown which we have found yeah. ourselves in? Okay. So look, the sentiment is a no-brainer. So that's absolutely improve sentiment. You, uh, you don't have to be a weatherman to know that the sentiment has improved. And that's uh, a really a necessary condition for any progress to take place. For example, if, Shakti, if the MPC were to reduce rates by 100 basis points, mm. that will really improve sentiment. So I think sentiment is a big story. Then the other story is that this has an effect has an immediate effect on the economy. So if the sentiment is improved, you have an immediate effect on the economy because you saw that you mentioned about asset prices going up by 10, 15%. You know, people saying this is a, a supply side thing, which I don't understand. Look, immediately, if anybody owns stock in India, their <laughs> income has gone up mm -hmm. and therefore one would hope and expect them to spend. So there's been an immediate impact on income gains. And there was likely to be 
some moderation in prices or no acceleration in prices, I think one should expect, given the deep slowdown we are in, that there will be some price cuts as well, because now the firms can afford mm. to cut prices even further. So I think the, the combination of uh, the policies, um, of the sentiment effect, and the fact that this is really both or well, probably the best structural and cyclical policy that I know in the literature or in the reading of other economies. And remember, while we have reduced personal income taxes, we meaning other countries as well, the change in business taxes or corporate taxes is very, very rare. Right. Okay. And that is why it is a very potent weapon. And it cuts across various problems of the economy, helps sort them out. For example, are we competitive? And this certainly will make investment in India much more competitive than ever before. And I think the real masterstroke, in my view, and no economist had talked about it, no policymaker had talked about it, I hadn't talked about it, I don't know anybody else who talked about it, is the provision for 15%. Uh, corporate tax for new investment. And that I would think is, is a genuine masterstroke. Uh, of course, all these small steps are, you know, towards the larger goal of the 5 trillion economy, which a lot of people believe is a, sort of a very optimistic target to have. And a lot of believe that it's not a, a target that we should be scared of. We should be looking to achieve the 5 trillion mark. What are your thoughts about it? Well, there are two aspects to uh, the $5 trillion goal. First, it's in nominal dollar terms. Mm. So it's not in rupee terms, it's not in real prices, it's plainly got to do with the US dollar India exchange rate. There is a well-known reality that developed countries growth rate is much lower than developing countries' growth rate. Of course, if you have the highest interest rates in the world, you can approximate the growth rate of the <laughs> developed countries, which we have tried to do, but hopefully this will not happen in the future. So, and the, the growth rate is about three or four or five percentage points higher. The US is growing somewhere around two. Germany, Western Europe, all these countries are growing at less than two, uh, two and a half. And India should be growing at six and a half, seven, seven and a half. What this means is that your currency is likely to be stable and even more likely to appreciate. Remember from 19, 2002 to 2009, 10, the rupee, it went up and down, but stayed broadly constant at 42 to the dollar. Right. Okay. We can expect, we recently saw the rupee go towards 69, and then we even went to 65, came back up. But the broad 10-year trend is for the currency to appreciate. The rupee, I expect, will appreciate somewhere around 1, 1.5 to 2% a year on average. Okay. Now, we know that nominal growth rates in Indian rupees or in any currency are down because of very, very low inflation. Inflation is practically dead around the world. Right. By dead, I mean around 2% or 3% for emerging markets. When I went to graduate school in the early 1970s, 2% was considered frictional inflation. So you had all the leading economists of the world talking about the, the fact that you know 2% inflation is frictional. Anything above that, is what is we need to worry about. Now, all the countries are finding it very difficult to even get to 2%. So, I think nominal GDP growth rates will be down. I don't think we're going to see 11%, 12% uh, nominal GDP growth rates. I think we'll see around 9, 10% nominal GDP growth rate. And if the currency appreciates by one, one and a half percent a year on average over five years, it's a done deal. It will, so what you need, you do your math. We had approximately 3 trillion. 
uh, and to get to 5 trillion over the next five years, we need to grow at something like 10% uh, in nominal dollar terms a year. So I think it's very doable. But as we've just discussed, it would not have been doable with, I, and I, I will go out on a limb and state that if the RBI and the MPC sticks with its uh, policy, which I don't understand, then I think the $5 trillion economy will become that much more difficult. Uh, I think Delhi, the center, fiscal policy has done its part. Now it's for the monetary policy guys to join in. All right. Thank you so much for your time, yeah. sir, and your wisdom. Okay. So that was from today's episode of Suraj Conversations. Thank you for joining us.